with you again. Uh, Becky, I might start doing that regularly. I like that. Uh, Becky was, she approached me a couple of weeks ago, and um, we've been going through the book of Ruth, and when we were doing that, I kind of changed up our routine a little bit, and every week we're giving a lady an opportunity to come up and, uh, and read the scriptures before I preach it, and uh, we were doing a chapter at a time, which is, is pretty rare for me. That's a lot to, to take on at one time. And um, I wasn't having the congregation stand for the duration of an entire chapter of Scripture. And uh, Becky said to me, you know, I really miss that, standing up for the reading of the Word, and I did too. So we're bringing it back today. Um, you will not be standing long, though. You're not going to be standing long this morning because our text isn't long, but just the same. We want to honor the substance. We want to honor the authority of what we're about to read. And we're actually going to the other extreme of things because we're just going to be looking at one verse in particular. And that is found in 1 John chapter 2, if you'll turn with me there. Not the Gospel of John, but uh, the letter of John, the first one, uh, near the end of your New Testament. Right before June of Revelation, you've got uh, three letters from John, the second and the third one. They're like a page total, maybe together. Um, we're looking at the one before that, 1 John chapter 2. And we'll be looking at verse 6. And... Um, I'm going to draw a lot from this this morning, uh, but uh, everything that I say in our time together is going to start here. So 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 6, and we're already standing in reference to what God has spoken. This is the word of God. These are the words of God given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We ought to receive them as such. The one who says he abides in him, and that him is Jesus. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walks. Say it with me if you believe it. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Whoever has ears to hear this morning, let them hear the Lord's prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for our gathering this morning. It is good to be among the saints. It is good to be among the people of God. It is good to be in the Word of God. Um, Father, commit that word to our hearts now, that we would leave this place in a different place, with our minds renewed, with our lives transformed, that a little bit more of your glory before us. May your spirit who inspired these words lead us as we consider them and powerfully work through them. We're confident in Christ that through him you hear us. So may we now hear you. Believing because of his promise that what we ask will receive. We won't leave here like we came. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. So, Reese hit something of a, of a milestone a couple weeks ago. Uh, he'll be nine months old tomorrow, hard to believe. His uncle's 37 years old today, by the way. In the back, so. I, was, I was watching him during Alliance Women a couple weeks back. Uh, Reese, not, not <laughs> and, uh, It was Guy's Night at the Parsonage, and Reese, he likes to play with water bottles. Um, like most kids his age, like you can give him the best toy on the shelf with the brightest colors, whatever makes the most noise, whatever does the most things, it has all the lights, and. Um, his Aunt Joan got him something really cool that he loves. He's got this dinosaur, and it will stomp, and it'll roar, and it'll dance, and it's got something like 70 different sounds and reactions. It makes no exaggeration. It's got like 70, and we love it. But, but Reese, no matter what, he's inevitably going to seek out like the cardboard box or the empty water bottle. And, and you're always like, hey, look at this, though. You're showing him something that's really cool, and, and he's just kind of just crunch and just kind of like looking up at, at his bottle distracted by whatever happens to be in front of him. And we had a Gatorade bottle a couple weeks ago and um, it made me a little cranky. And uh, you know this, if, if you're a parent or a grandparent, once you got kids or grandkids, like you just do all kinds of stupid things to try to get them to laugh. You make weird faces, you, you and, and he, so he had this bottle, so I kind of ran my head into him and went bonk. And he just, he loved it. He just, he just burst out. I did it like 20 times in a row. And he kept laughing. And then when I stopped, he wanted to keep going. So, uh, so that was, that was fun. It kind of worked. So the next day I'm in the office and I, I get a text from Jenny. And, uh, 
he's got this noisemaker, it's a white noisemaker. In theory, it's supposed to help him sleep, uh, but it makes all kinds of noises, ocean noises, wind noises, and fan noises, it's got a few different settings. And sometimes he'll just pick it up, and he'll just start waving it around, and it's kind of heavy. So we're always nervous that he's gonna like hit himself in the face, and he's done that a few times, and he's let us know that he's done that a few times. Okay. And uh, then he likes to wave that thing around. Anyway, he was swinging that thing around, and uh, he started smacking Jenny in the head with it and laughing. And uh, she's texting me, and I said, as I'm at the office, I'm like, oh, you know, what's he been watching on TV? It's going to be an inevitable question that you ask. So um, I want us to consider this morning the Christ life. The Christ life. And our imitation of the Christ life. I was reading an old circulation by A.B. Simpson. I don't even think he wrote it. It was sort of compiled from things that he'd said, sermons that he'd written, but I was reading it this month, and I was so taken by the simplicity of his approach to this that I decided that should be a sermon. That should, that should turn that into a sermon, so that's what I did. So this is going to bear a lot of resemblance. It's not totally the same. You can read the articles. It's in the book Fourfold Gospel. It's been published. But there's a lot of similarity there. But uh, I just I loved his simplicity in this. I love how much he was able to bring out about just this one verse, 1 John chapter 2. So let's, let's consider again what's being expressed there. The one who says he abides in him, in the Lord, ought. All right, so that right there, there's obligation there, right? Ought. The one who says he abides in him ought himself. To walk in the same manner as he walked, as Jesus walked, okay? The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. In fact, if you look just before that in your Bible, if you're looking at 1 John, walking as Jesus walked is given to us as the very evidence that we're in Jesus. Put simply, if we're believers, our lives should imitate Christ. And I believe that if we're abiding in him, he'll give us all the power to do that by his Holy Spirit. And the fruit of that, based on this passage, is the assurance that we belong to him. So I want us to consider the Christ life. And to help us do that, we're going to look at the life of Christ from five different perspectives. We're going to look at the motive of his life, the principle of his life, the standard of his life, the source of his life. And the activity of his life. Motive, principle, standard, source, the activity of the life of Jesus Christ. Let's consider first the motive of his life. What was the motive of the life of Jesus Christ? In other words, why did he walk the way that he walked, the way that we as his followers are to walk? What was the motive of his life? Very simple answer. Devotion to the will and glory of God. That was his deepest conviction. Even when you find the earliest accounts of the life of Jesus when he's young, when he's 12 years old, when he's a child, we can see this heart. His parents come looking for him. Remember the story in Luke? His parents, they go looking for him and they find him in the temple. And what does he tell them? He said, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? And it, it never changed. Jesus' motivation in life never changed. In John chapter 4, this is 20-some years later, he said, My food, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. One chapter later, he says, I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. A chapter beyond that, and it's I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In the garden on the night of his betrayal, it's not my will, but your will be done. Then at the end of his life, he says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Are you noticing a pattern? This is the motivation of Christ. Devotion to the will and glory of God. Above all else. And if you want to know more precisely what that looks like. In Luke 19, he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the work that he'd been given. So if we're going to walk as he walked, we need to embrace that, don't we? We need the same motivation in our hearts that resonates inside of us, that reorients whatever we're doing so that whatever other intention we've got, whatever that is, it takes an immediate backseat to the will. 
and the glory of God in absolutely everything. We need to start looking at everything around us as an opportunity for being about our Father's business. Everything. Everything. A.W. Tozer, um, he would have turned 125 on Thursday. He's a few years older than my brother. We, we, put, up a, uh, we put up a Facebook post uh, celebrating, honoring Tozer this week. And um, he said this once. He said, it's time for us to rise up, church. It's time for us to get out of our rut, get out of our routine, and start to take our Christian faith seriously. All right? He went to be with the Lord in 1963. If it was time for that when Tozer said that, how much more is it that time for us? It's past time for us to, to rise up. It's past time for us to get out of our ruts and our routines. And it's past time to begin to take our Christian faith seriously. To the degree that the will and the glory of God becomes the primary reasons for absolutely everything. Everything else in our lives is contingent on that one thing. The will of God, the glory of God. That's what it's all about. I'm talking about a, a divine uh, reframing of all of our daily routines. So what does that look like? I mean, you're not, you're not going to the store to buy bread because you ran out of bread. If you're going there for that, that's... That's, that's true, but that's secondary. <laughs> Primary is that maybe the girl that's selling you the bread doesn't know what Jesus did for her, and you have every ability to change that. So you're not, you're not going to the doctor to, to get a checkup on your health. You're going for that, but you're also going to testify to your doctor that you have life even beyond if your health fails. You're no longer going to work to earn a living and pay your bills. Right? You're going there to earn a living and pay your bills, but you're also going there to talk about the eternal living that Jesus earned for you and the one that paid your bill of sin by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. Primary becomes the will and the glory of God. Everything else, everything else becomes secondary to that. The motive of the Christ life was devotion to the will and the glory of God. Is that the motive of your life? Is that the motive of your life? The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk as he wants. How about the principle of Christ's life? Every life has a controlling principle. Saved or not, heaven bound or not, honoring the Lord, working in the harvest or not, every life has a controlling principle. For some, it's, it's selfishness. Right? They're self-seeking, their self-interest, whether that's greed or it's ambition or it's pleasure. For others, it's devotion to something, maybe some pursuit. Uh, the arts, it's a hobby, something you want to accomplish, something you want to invent, something you want to become. Whatever it is that fuels your spirit, it guides your words, it guides your actions and your thinking. But for Christ, for him, there was only ever one principle, above all others. And it was love. To love. And the law that he left for us is as simple as it is comprehensive. It's summed up like this. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. As I have loved you. John 13, 34. And he repeats it. In John 15, 12. And he repeats it again. In John 15, 17. We did this once. I had you turn a bunch of places. I think it was last fall. I'm not going to have you turn all those places again, but by way of reminder, in Genesis chapter 1, when God created the heavens and the earth and darkness was upon the face of the deep, God spoke into the darkness and he said just four words, let there be light. What happened? There was light. John chapter 11, Jesus' friend Lazarus has been dead for four days, buried in a cave behind a rock. Jesus gets to the town. He gets to the tomb. He cries out with a loud voice, just three words this time. He says, Lazarus, come out. What happened? Yeah. Lazarus came out. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is walking along, and he sees this tax collector named Matthew. He's the one they named the book after. He sees him there, and he says just two words this time. He says, follow me. What happened? Follow him. He followed him. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, when this armed mob came to arrest him and his disciples are there in the garden and one of them pulls out a sword, he, he looks at him, he stops him, and he says, don't you know, 
Don't you know that I can appeal to my Father and at once? He would send 12 legions of angels. Jesus is expressing there, all I got to do is say the word. Light's created in four words. The dead is raised in three words. Two words change the eternal destiny of a man. And one word would have been enough to dispatch tens of thousands of angels to his side in an instant. And the Lord never once had to repeat himself, and he didn't have to repeat himself when he said love one another, but he did it anyway, and he did it twice. I think he really wanted us to hear that. And I think more than that, I think he really wanted us to do that. There are warnings about hearing and not doing, right? We need to be doers of the word, not just hearers deluding ourselves. I think he really wanted us to hear that. I think he really wanted us to do that. And, and this is this is not, by the way, this, I think this is important to point out. This is not, when, when he says this law I give you, this is not the Old Testament law of love. It's not. It's not the same. This is not love your neighbor as yourself. If it was, if that's what Jesus was saying, how could he call it new? He says a new commandment I give to you. Think about that. So it's not the old law of love. This is the new law of love. It's not love your neighbor as yourself. It's love one another as I have loved you. Notice that the standard moves from you to Jesus. From the imperfect love that's measured by what? By self? To a love that is perfect. To a love that is self-sacrificing. The principle of Jesus' life was love. For his father, for his own, for the sinful and the stumbling, for the sick and the lonely, for the lost, for his enemies, even as they nail his hands and his feet to that tree. Love covered the whole of Christ's life. It was the principle behind his person. And if it becomes ours, it simplifies a lot of questions. Love, we're told in 1 Corinthians 13, is patient, and it's kind, it's not jealous, it doesn't brag, it's not arrogant, it, it doesn't act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked, it doesn't take into account a wrong suffered, it doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but it rejoices with the truth, and it bears all things, and it believes all things, and it hopes all things, and it endures all things, and it never fails. Faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. In the very next chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, that's tragically not read very often after we hear that part at weddings, the next part starts by saying, pursue love. That word pursue, it's the same word that Jesus used when he stopped Paul, then called Saul in your Bible, dead in his tracks on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting, persecuting me? That's the same word. It's the same word. He's taking a negative term and he's refashioning it and he's repurposing it and he's, he's telling us that love, this thing that's described so carefully for us in that text that comes right before, telling us what it is and what it's not, and its value, and, and what it looks like, its characteristics, that this love is something worth hunting, that it's something that's worth going after with this unrelenting fervency in us. Because if you put, if you put this idea back in the context of Acts chapter 9, it's the same word that's used to describe Saul's ruthlessness when he's chasing down the people of God, and he's jailing them, he's dragging them off to prison. We're told that he was breathing his persecution. That's the kind of consuming passion that the Lord is having us, he's calling us to have as believers, to, to live this out. It's the way that we're supposed to love, we're supposed to be intense in it, to have even this kind of obsession in our lives, to love. The principle of Christ's life was love. One who says he abides in him, allow himself to walk in the way that he walked. The motive, devotion to the will and glory of God, the principle, love. But even so, every life's got to have a standard too. And Christ's was molded by the scriptures. Listen to this. 
Luke 24, he said, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things that are written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now he's talking about the prophetic. Understand, Jesus is altogether unique. He, he, he being the only expected person in the history of the world. His whole life, his whole legacy, it's known, it's written down, it's anticipated hundreds of years, even thousands of years before he appears. There is no one else like him. He makes that clear. When he shows up at his ministry, he goes to the temple in Nazareth. He stands among the people, the hand of the scroll of Isaiah. He reads it, and then everybody looks at him. He sits back down, everybody's looking at him. And he says, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, I am the fulfillment of the word of God. This is the Jesus who said to his doubters and his objectors, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because you wrote about me. This is the Jesus who, on the road to Emmaus, after he rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples and were told the beginning with Moses and all the prophets. He explained everything concerning himself in all the scriptures. He's unique in that. But... That doesn't mean the Bible doesn't talk about you. It does talk about you. It has much to say about you. Understand that just as it was necessary that Christ's life should fulfill the scriptures, and in fact that he could not die on the cross until he first lived out every word that had been written about him, we need to live likewise. If we're to walk as he walked, what right do we have to let a single promise or a single command become a, a dead letter as far as we're concerned. The Bible says a lot about us. Simpson said God wants us to prove in our own experience all the things that have been written in this book. He wants us to bind the Bible in a new and living edition in the flesh and blood of our lives. Amen? This book has a lot to say about you. The motive of Christ was devotion to the will and glory of God. The principle of Christ was love. The standard of the life of Christ was the scriptures. How about the source of his life? Where did he get his strength to be this supernatural and perfect example for us? Was it in himself? Was it just because he was God in the flesh? Because Philippians says he suspended his own self-contained rights, that he lived among us in humiliation as a man, as one of us. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. How much can he do of himself, church? Nothing. nothing. The Son can do nothing of himself unless... It is something he sees his father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. He said, I can do nothing on my own initiative. John chapter 5, that's what he said. I can do nothing on my own initiative. John chapter 6 says, the living father sent me, and I live because of the father. So he who eats me, he who eats the bread of life will live because of me, Jesus told us. Stop and think for just a second. The Son of God, who healed the sick, and raised the dead, and walked on water, and spoke with such authority that it shook the self-righteous and it made the demons beg. He derived all of his daily strength from the same source that we receive ours from. Communion with God, a life of dependence, faith. Prayer and receiving and being filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. He humbled himself to the same place of dependence as us. He will exalt us to the same place of victory. I believe that with all my heart, in our walk, in our lives. I looked at the motive and the principle and the standard and the source, but and if we're going to talk about the walk of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about walking the way that he walked. We better say something about the activities of Jesus' life. When Peter was first preaching, this is uh, Acts chapter 10. Peter's first preaching to the Gentiles. He starts and he asks this question. He says, 
He says, uh, have you, you've heard of Jesus, right? You've heard of him? It's this question. And then he goes on to remind him who he's talking about. He says, the anointed one from Nazareth, that Jesus. That he went about doing good. That's how he finishes the description. Jesus was known for doing good. You think about his, his life, his ministry, just three and a half years, his ministry. It's a very short biography. If you read through the Gospels, and you'll see him traveling on foot to like every portion of Galilee and Samaria and Judea. He's preaching and he's teaching and he's working in, in Mark. And this is actually near the beginning of his ministry. And Mark, we're told that it was getting to the point where the crowds were so intense that he didn't have time to eat and his family thought he lost his senses. They didn't believe in him. And they actually went to drag him out of there and to take him back home and say enough is enough. But his life was constantly devoted to ministries of active love. And he says, the Father sent me, so I send you. And what's the hardest about that maybe is that, is that Jesus didn't save those ministries of active love for those that loved him. He fed the crowds that grumbled against them. He gave them more than they needed. They leftovers. He washed the feet of Judas on the very night that he betrayed him. And he knew where he was going after supper. And Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And just two verses later, the language is brought into even greater symmetry with what I'm talking about because it tells us that it was while we were his enemies that Christ died for us, that Christ reconciled us. The world doesn't think that way. The world says, get even with your enemies. Get even with them. If you're able to, you get an opportunity, you take it. But if not, you can't get even with them, well, at least get away from them. Cut them out of your life. Jesus is calling us to be actively and counterintuitively involved in the lives even of our enemies and all for their betterment, just like he was. So who hates you? Who has disowned or disregarded you this morning? Maybe like Paul. Well, he wrote, maybe as much as it's dependent on you, you've, you've lived at peace with them, you've tried to live at peace with them, but everything you say just seems to be misunderstood, it seems to be misinterpreted, you cannot get on the right side of them. Jesus is telling you to seek them out, keep seeking them out, intentionally do them good. Don't miss that, because I think, I think we can feel like we're standing in a place of obedience if we just simply refuse to retaliate. But there's a positive command in the scriptures to overcome evil with good. And that can only be done through acts of grace for the ungracious and acts of kindness for the kinds who don't deserve it. And that means going out of our way to do it. Way, way out of our way to do it. How far? How far was the cross from the glory of heaven? I would say no further than that. You realize how far Jesus came to do you good. You, you tend to just stop counting the steps. The one who says he abides in, he and himself to walk in the same manner as he walked, with the same motive, devotion to the will and glory of God, with the same principle, love, with the same standard, the scriptures, with the same source, dependent communion on the spirits, and with the same activity, ministries of active love. Love gets mentioned twice in this list of five because Jesus repeated himself. It comes back. You know that famous poem my, my grandparents had was hanging up in their dining room? You know that famous poem, Footprints in the Sand? It's a short one. The author says, Lord, you promised you'd always walk beside me. Why is it, and why is it when I look back? And I see the hardest points in my life. Why is it at those, at those times that I'm only seeing one set of footprints? And the Lord says, I would never, ever leave you. When you only saw one set of footprints, it was that that I carried you. Oh, that's a beautiful sentiment. And he absolutely does do that. He, he carries us, right? He'll never leave us. 
And I don't want to take away from that. There's some good theology on the presence of the Lord in suffering in that. I don't want to take away from that for a second. But when it comes to this verse, and walking as Jesus walked, understand, Christian, this is a call for there to always be one set of footprints when you look back. See, when you walk beside someone, sometimes you'll turn this way, and they'll turn that way. You walk beside someone, you can never really commit fully to following. The call of the Christian life is to follow Jesus. By the way, he'll still carry you. outside of these walls, everywhere where the sole of our feet touch. Father, I ask these things for the sake of Jesus. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. The altar is open. If you need prayer, someone would love to come with you to the throne of grace this morning and pray with you. So I want to encourage you to come as we dismiss. Join us next week. Bring someone back with you. We're going to be giving our attention to Joel, not the book, but the man. Joel Garcia in the back is going to be bringing the word forth for the first time next week. So be in prayer for him and look forward to it as much as I'm looking forward to it. And uh, join us. Join us next week. Bring someone along. Would you stand up for a minute? Thank you.